Yo people, welcome to the video. It's me Mike Phone on here it is. So I'm not sure if it's the actual law that you've got to start videos like this with this disclaimer, but just in case it is, just to avoid any potential future messy legal battles, I will say this. Nothing in this video is financial advice. I'm not a qualified financial advisor. And in fact, the whole video is solely for entertainment purposes. So please do not so much as go out and buy a tin of beans just because I said. However, if I can encourage you to go away and do your own research into things, then make informed decisions based on your own critical thinking then that would be ideal so with all that being said if I was sat here in 2021 and I had the option of sending back a message through time to my younger self there would probably be a few things I would tell myself about investing for the future and I'm going to tell you those things so they are not in order and it is not an exhaustive list but here they are actually you know before we get into this list I just want to say something right so you'll see these videos and people talk about the best ways to invest and the first thing they always say or maybe it's the last thing because they build up to it like it's some kind of crescendo right is like invest in yourself so I'm not going to say that because a, I think it's obvious. B, I'm kind of talking monetarily and obviously we all want to generally try and improve ourselves even if that's through like skills and knowledge that doesn't always necessarily incur a cost, right? Because a lot of time you can just learn stuff on YouTube and read stuff on the internet and all that kind of stuff, right? So I'm actually not going to say that. I'm just going to assume that it is a given, right? But investing in yourself and investing in your own business are two things that I would definitely draw a distinction between and I will get onto the whole business thing in a bit. I just wanted to clear that up right so the first thing actually never applied to me and it might not even apply to a lot of you however if it does it's certainly worth mentioning so if you are lucky enough to have an employer that matches your pension contributions or even beats them then you should certainly be making the most of those contributions so for example if your employer matches your pension contributions then if you only put 100 into your pension every month then they only put 100 in right if you put 200 in then they put 200 in you see how it works right and so what you need to be doing ideally is figuring out or just asking Asking them what is the maximum you're able to contribute to receive that contribution from them and then working towards doing that because this is essentially free money right and you want to get all the free money you can right real one of life get as much free money as you can then make the rest that you need yourself now there's actually an argument against making pension contributions in certain circumstances now I mean in favor of other things I don't mean just not saving any money whatsoever right and that is really because we don't know what pensions are gonna look like by the time young people retire and also you might have to be like 150 before you can actually get your hands on it right however if your employer is contributing significantly to your pension then I would say the benefit of all that free money does outweigh those risks and concerns so like I said there might be a limit on what you're able to contribute to receive that contribution from your employer but in an ideal world, you would work towards absolutely maximizing that limit. So just contribute as much as you can and then you get as much free money off them. Right, so the second thing I wanna talk about is a stocks and shares ISA. So even if you are pretty new to the world of personal finance, I'm sure you've heard the term ISA before. It stands for Individual Savings Account and it's an account that you are allowed to contribute 20,000 pounds per year to that runs over the tax year so April to April and none of the interest that you make off that will be subject to any kind of taxes whatsoever so no income tax no capital gains tax or anything like that now since 2016 we've actually had a personal savings allowance in the UK which means that interest that you make on any kind of savings account up to £1,000 for basic rate taxpayers is actually completely free of tax anyway. So if you're a basic rate taxpayer and you make £1,000 interest on any savings account whatsoever, you won't pay any tax on that either. Now for higher rate taxpayers, your limit is actually £500. And also interest that's already tax free doesn't count towards that personal allowance. So if you already have an ISA and you're making interest on that account, then that doesn't count towards your £1,000 tax free interest you're allowed. Now the type of ISA that most people will be familiar with is called a cash ISA and currently interest rates available for cash ISAs are pretty terrible to be honest. Just about the best you'll get is around 1%. Now considering that that is lower than what's typical for inflation, then yes, your money will actually be worth less in a year's time than it was when you put it into the account. However, there are a few different types of ISAs and I'm not going to talk in detail about all of them right now, although I will go into them in another video if you want me to. But the one I want to talk about today is called a stocks and share. ISA. Now, with a traditional cash ISA, the bank tries to make money on your money through many different ways, really, but one of them might be offering it out as loans or mortgages and charging a higher interest rate than the one they're giving you. So if I say, give me all your money and I'll give you 1% interest in a year's time, and then I loan it all out to Dave and I say, you owe me 5% interest on that in a year's time, then I will keep the difference and that's how I want to make my profit. Now, with a stocks and shares ISA, that money is directly invested into the stock 
stock market. And so given the current interest rates available for cash ices compared with the typical annual growth of the stock market as a whole, there really is no competition. Now, of course, the stock market could crash or correct or however you want to say, go down a lot. And so from one year to the next, the investment in your stocks and shares ISA might decline, right? It might decline dramatically if there is a big stock market crash. You could put all your money in it today and then check it in a year's time and you might actually cry because it's worth like 20% less or 30% less, right? That's perfectly possible. However, what you have to remember is that if you are a young person as per the title of this video, you should be investing for the long term. And so what your account looks like in a year's time is actually pretty irrelevant. The whole point of investing is that it's long term and the longer you leave your money in the stock market, the safer that becomes because in general, overall, it goes up. From 1984 to 2019, the FTSE 100 would have provided you with an overall return of 1,377% if you reinvested all your dividends. That's the same as a 7.5% increase year on year. Now, there are obviously bad years in 2008. It was minus 30% plus, but overall, you are far, far in the green. Now, there are plenty of options for your stocks and shares ISA, both in terms of the provider and in terms of what you want inside that ISA, and that will depend on your risk tolerance and also how much time you're actually willing to dedicate to it. So there are plenty of options that are really good, just set and forget low maintenance options. And those are things like index funds and ETFs that I can talk about more in another video. So once you have this open, you can just drip feed money into it regularly, watch it grow and reap the benefits of compound interest. Now, as I said, there is a £20,000 limit on what you're able to deposit into this account every year. Now, that might seem somewhat unattainable for a lot of people right now, but I do think it's a good long-term goal to aim to be maximizing that. So that is saving 20,000 pounds a year. That's 1,660 something pounds per month. And I know that that can seem out of reach, but I'm just saying over the long term, over five years, over 10 years, you don't know what your earnings are gonna be. And hopefully one day you can get to a point where you are maximizing that ISA allowance. Now, if you want me to talk about the different options available in terms of providers and also what you can have in those accounts, then let me know, I will get to it in the video. Right, the third thing I want to talk about is an emergency fund. Now, I know that this is a super common recommendation that people make, at least in the whole personal finance world, but I think it's common for a reason, right? It's essential. You do need to have some kind of money stashed away for emergencies, right? You might get made redundant. Your car might explode. You might just incur some unforeseen big financial cost, and you want to have the funds there essentially so that you don't have to borrow them from somebody else, because usually borrowing the funds is going to mean that you have to pay interest on that and so it's just going to make everything more expensive not to mention making everything more stressful now if for some reason you're unable to keep up with the payments on the loan or the credit card that you had to use for this emergency then you're going to incur late fees and penalties and other charges that are going to make it harder and harder for you to escape this debt so obviously if you can just make some preparations so you can avoid risking ever having to go into the debt in the first place then that is by far the better option aside from the actual financial benefit of it even if you never use your emergency fund, it's great to have there just for the peace of mind. Literally just the inner peace that you will get from that is certainly worth the effort that it takes to save it up in the first place. Now, some people say that you should have a month's worth of living expenses saved up. Some say three, some say six months. Obviously, it's gonna differ for people in different circumstances, but of course, more is better. If you happen to have parents that will bail you out in an emergency situation, then maybe it's not quite as urgent, but still, in an ideal world, you wanna be able to like stand on your own two feet, don't you? And not have to depend on other people, right? Because I mean, unless they're gonna leave you a lot of inheritance, then one day you, you, you will have to like. So does this emergency fund need to be separate from your ISA? Well, not necessarily, because if you have an ISA where you can access the funds quickly and without penalty, then there's absolutely no reason why you can't just keep your emergency fund stash within the ISA. And that way, you know, you're not just keeping a large chunk of money on the side that isn't making any interest or isn't doing anything for you. So I know that in and of itself, an emergency fund might not necessarily seem like an investment but if it stands a good chance of saving you money in the future, then I would certainly consider it one and, you know, semantics, whether it is one or not, it's definitely worth doing. Just do it, right? Now, of course, we do need to be smart with the money that we have to ensure that we're getting the best return possible on it because that can make a huge difference to your finances and to your quality of life overall. However, unless you have a very, very large amount to begin with, such that the interest that you make off it is substantial, then really, you shouldn't be looking to 
realize any of the gains from your investments in the short term whatsoever. So in five years time, in 10 years time, you should really still be looking to add to your investments rather than draw down on them. So investing in something that's actually going to make you money through turning a profit rather than just through making interest or dividends on it is certainly a far quicker way of actually making money that is going to impact your life in the near term. What I'm trying to say is, of course, we can and should be as smart with our money as possible, right? But at some point in your life, you're gonna to have to just make some money, right? So you save as well as you can, you invest as well as you can. At some point, you just gotta make money. Now, as with anything, there is a risk and reward element, right? So you stick 500 pounds in a cash ISA and it's safe, but your reward is virtually nil, right? Stick 500 pounds in an index fund, it's fairly safe, bit more risky, but your reward is better than the cash ISA, right? Stick 500 pounds in your own business or in contributing towards something that can make you money directly and you actually might lose it all, right? Or you might double it in like months, yeah? Or you might triple it, right? But the thing is, when you're young, that is when you take the riskier investments, right? When you're 65, you don't take your life savings and bang them all into Tesla stock, right? Because it could crash and then you got nothing to retire on. And then you're like an 80 year old man with a paper round, right? Not that there's anything wrong with that if you really want a paper round, but you should be doing it out of choice, yeah? Not, not because you're forced to. So if you're young, you can take the risk because if they go tits up, then you've got the rest of your life to actually rectify that. And also when you're young and you don't have kids and other commitments, you should take advantage of that extra time you have to put into things. You know, you can afford to start a business really slowly because you're not depending on the profits to live. You can do a lot of the work yourself so you don't have to outsource things and that way you can reduce your overheads. And if it's a product-based business, you can start with very small batch orders and test the water before you gradually ramp things up. Now, I don't want this to get into a completely different video of like side hustles and making money and stuff but I do want to give you a few examples like when you hear people on YouTube talking about making money and side hustles or little projects and stuff like that what they usually say is be a YouTuber like me right obviously that is one example but it's not the only one I want to give because not everyone wants to be a YouTuber mate and not everyone is particularly suited to it either probably so what are some of the things well one example is something simple like arbitrage and that just involves buying something from somewhere where you feel like you can get a good deal on it in order to then sell it somewhere else at a markup so you don't actually interfere with the product whatsoever right and it doesn't have to be some sexy new product it doesn't have to be some new dragon's den invention right it can just be something boring and plain that people actually need so you might import a thousand tv remotes from china and then sell them all individually on ebay right and your cost of importing that thousand at once might make it cheaper than somebody importing a thousand individually and so maybe you can offer a better price overall than the guy who is sat in china shipping remotes one by one to people in the uk who buy them on ebay i hope you get what i'm trying to say you get it right or you could come up with a new product right there's companies that do white labeling which basically means they already make the product and you just slap your own brand on it right a lot of people do that it's super popular these days or you could have something made especially right but of course you don't want to be flying to Shenzhen when you're 19 and halfway through a sociology degree just to test the product quality, right? So you also probably can't afford the minimum order quantities. So you might just start with a smaller batch of some locally produced products. Did I say produced products, locally made products? You know what I'm saying? Alternatively, you could physically make something yourself and sell it through eBay or Etsy or even Facebook Marketplace, right? A lot of people made money doing that kind of stuff over this pandemic especially. Or it might not be a product, right? It could be a service that you offer or a skill. You could just download Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop, watch some YouTube tutorials to teach yourself how to use it, practice, 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 get really good, and then offer people a service, right? And there are a million things like that that are simply just a case of learning a skill, but these are skills that you are very capable of teaching yourself and probably for free through YouTube tutorials and other online resources, right, that you probably don't even have to pay for. So it could be web design, it could be Facebook, Ads, it could be making YouTube thumbnails or backing tracks for YouTubers to use in the videos, right? Or any number of things. When you're young, it is really worth risking a bit of your money or spending a bit of your time working on something that you can physically just make money out of now. Now, there are obviously a lot of other ways that you could invest your money when you're young or middle-aged or old for that matter, but I did want to keep this video pretty general. I didn't want to go into the specifics of different types of asset classes because a lot of those you can actually get exposure to through your stocks and shares ISA anyway so that's all encapsulated within that but I might go into that kind of thing in another video in the future now the last thing I want to say is 
I'm talking totally about investing your money here, not about spending it, right? Spending and investing is different. The best way to invest your money might not necessarily be the best way to spend it, right? The best way to spend it could potentially be pissing it up the wall in Ibiza with your mates, right? I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying that that's out there on the table. It is one potential option among many. So I'm not making any uh, judgment about that and saying like, when you're young, you should just stuff all your money into savings. Like, you know, of course we all have to choose. Well, we all have to choose everything. That's the main message. 